And it's a hard conversation to have. Not everybody can just get on a plane and leave. People just think proactive, just not react. Mr. Des Brown, welcome to the Fortis Impact Talk. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Very nice to talk to you. Des, tell us a little bit about yourself. What's, how did all this start for you? How long have you got? Uh, <laughs> Bernard, I've been in the martial arts in one way or the other all my life. Um, you know, as, as a youngster, I started out doing karate, I suppose, like everyone does. You know, your parents get hotful and they go, you need some discipline and off you go at the age of seven and you go and do some karate, you know. And uh, that, that kind of, you, you know, martial arts combatives, that whole kind of zeitgeist, it gets into your bloodstream and stays with you for life. Um, and as a teenager, I continued studying karate, not because I was crazy about karate, but, you know, I'm talking back in the 80s. Uh, there wasn't, there was no internet, there wasn't much around, you know, you kind of took what you could find. And uh, I trained diligently for a number of years. Uh, I went and did military service. Um, I was an artilleryman, but I, in my second year of service, I volunteered to be part of a contingency group that uh, was joined up with 3-2 Battalion um, on the Angolan border. And I took part in operations and I do have for what it's worth, some combat experience. Um, and, you know, people like you to throw that in because it somehow means something. What it means is that you, you know, you got shot at like everyone else. Uh, you were very scared like everyone else. And you join the ranks of old people who say, when I was. Uh, so it's really meaningless. It has no, no context in terms of what we're talking about tonight. Um, but it does give one an appreciation of... Uh, I think what it what it means to face life and death situations, um, which is a perspective that I'm very grateful not many people get to experience. Uh, when I left the military, I kind of regrouped, you know, it took me a few years to find my feet. Um, I started working, started a family and drifted back into the martial arts and again, back to karate, Okinawan Gojiru karate. But at the same time, I was, you know, there was a sense of seeking. Um, I wanted something more. I wanted, I wanted to dig deeper and find out where this came from, what the roots were, how, how is it applicable? Um, and what is practical? You know, because I, I think I understood intuitively the difference between an art and a practical system at that point. And um, I tried to connect the dots. So in that journey, which was, you know, over the next decade, decade and a half, uh, I continued with karate. I did a little bit of uh, Shaolin Kung Fu uh, in Johannesburg. I was exposed to a bit of Wing Chun. I did some Aikido. I did some Tai Chi. I did, gosh, let me think, Japanese Jiu Jitsu with Sam Tonkin for a little while. Um, and all the while trying to, trying to find, find the common denominators, you know, kind of piece things together for myself. And toward the end of that journey, I at one point was teaching a Tai Chi class um, to a group of people. And they, they knew a little bit about my background and said to me, you know, teach us some self-defense. And my, you know, my style is to say yes and then figure out how. Generally, it gets me into a lot of trouble. Um, and I said to them, sure, you know, we'll do. And I took two weeks and I cobbled together this entirely homemade system of self-defense. Uh, and I thought to myself, well, what's practical? What are people likely to do? They, they hit you, they push you, they grab you. There's, you know, responses to chokes. There's what if they have a knife? What if they have a gun, etc., etc. And so I built up this, this cute little homemade thing of my own, you know, over the course of a couple of weeks and started teaching it. To my amazement, the people who I was teaching actually didn't immediately identify me as a fraud. Um, and they really liked it. Um, and so I started teaching and that little class grew. Uh, quite significantly. And one night, six months later, uh, a gentleman, a little more senior in years, walked into the class and he said to me, would you mind if I watched? And I said, yes, with pleasure. You know, and he went and sat in the corner, very distinguished, very, very lovely man. When I was finished, he came to me, you know, after everyone had left and he said, so what is this you're teaching? And I knew I'd been, I'd been made, you know, like, okay, you've got me. I said to him, it's, well, this is my mom's home, my home knitted jersey. I just so I put it together. This is, you know, this is this is my thing. And he said to me, you know, this is remarkably like the old Krav Maga. Have you have you heard about Krav Maga? Should you, you know, have you be, ever been interested? 
And I'd heard about it, you know, I didn't know much about it, but I kind of, I had an inkling as to what it, what it, you know, what it entailed. It turned out um, that the gentleman was Jeff Miller, who uh, studied and taught at the Wingate Institute. He was a very highly ranked instructor with the IKMF in Israel, um, taught and accredited several instructors in South Africa at a very high standard. And, and he was just like the most marvelous man, very gentle, very um, extraordinarily knowledgeable. And for some reason, I have no idea why, he took a liking to me and he invited me to come and you know learn some of the basics. He gave me teaching plans, he gave me study manuals, he gave me class planners. Um, he showed me how to teach, how it fitted together, what, what this was. You know, and as that process happened, it was like a, the proverbial light bulb went off over my head. And all of a sudden, everything came together. All these things I'd been looking for, I'd found. Because it was a process of distillation. You know, you know, if you look at the martial arts, there's a lot of stuff out there. And to try and strip away the unnecessary and get to the kernel of things can be quite difficult, especially if you have a limited perspective. And I think that's what, for me, Krav Maga embodied. It was, it was a case of stripping things down to the essentials, making them practical, and connecting the dots in a very real way that you can immediately see, you know, works to, to one degree or the other. Um, and to put it bluntly, I fell in love. You know, that was the start of a journey for me that has now been, you know, 15, almost 20 years in the making. Um, and I know it's been a long story already. I'll already stop now. But uh, <laughs> I started, you know, teaching know. Krav Maga formally. A couple of years later, we affiliated with an Israeli organization uh, who we've since broken away from. And we're entirely South African now for a number of reasons, which I could talk about. Um, but, you know, in essence, that's how Elite Defense Academy International came into being. And we went from being one little class in a dingy scout hall one day to where we are today, where we have, uh, you know, 50, 50 plus certified instructors. We have more than 30 clubs across South Africa and in seven other countries. Um, we have, as you know, the weapons division. So we, we kind of branch out and specialize a bit. We've got 1834 Tactical. Um, we've, we're busy right now with our EDA Krav Maga University, which is an online training platform. Uh, we have an aviation division. We have a warrior women division. We have a steel division, which is physical uh, conditioning and so on and so on. And it's not something that I've done deliberately. It's been an outworking, I believe, of a culture we've built, a culture of inclusivity. And I know it sounds like I'm boasting. I'm, I'm, I'm really not humble bragging. I'm just saying that um, I think that if things are done out of out of a sense of passion, a sense of love for what you do, then inevitably people people gravitate toward that, and it turns them on. You know, and, and that's been Absolutely. our experience. Absolutely. And so, yeah, I'm kind of an accidental Krabist. Here I am. Yeah. But it's it's amazing to 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 listen to what you're saying and, and just how it just exploded and grew just as you found the roots of it, what you were looking for. Tell me, um, martial arts in general, uh, how does that add to a life, you know, as, as a person's life development and skills? Would you, would you say that, you know, that the path that you've taken and where you've gotten to this point, that mar obviously martial arts had a big influence on it? And yeah, it's um, I could I could I could give you the cliched answers, you know, all, all the things about um, how your self confidence improves and how your uh, decision making under pressure changes and your perspective on life changes and how you gain uh, you know a kind of an understanding of war versus peace, you know, and uh, different ways of influencing people, um, character building, you know, all and all of those are true. They're absolutely true, and I, I believe it to be true whether you. You know, whether you do a traditional martial art like a karate or something, whether you do a combative sport like MMA or Muay Thai or BJJ, or whether you do, you know, a slightly more stripped down version like a Krav Maga or combatives program, I think at the end of the day, they install similar attributes in a person. Um, where I think it makes a massive difference um, is that it teaches you a couple of things not least of which is that the greatest enemy you'll ever face is the one between your own two ears. I think it's something that is Great. obvious Great. in all combative endeavors, um, but it's not usually brought to the surface. It's not usually pointed out. Whether you're a guy who you know does karate competitively or whether you are an expert shooter taking part 
in a world-class shoot or as part of a response team kicking down doors and dealing with bad people. At the end of the day, the growth that happens to you is not just about external skill. It's about confronting the parts of yourself that hold you back. Uh, I'm talking about things like doubt and fear. And sometimes that's fear of failure and fear of success or both. Um, it forces you to confront who you really are. And I think it's, it's deeply humbling. If we approach that in the right way and if we understand it correctly, it makes us better people because we grow more tolerant of others. We understand that not everybody thinks the same way, that we're all on our own journey um, and that sometimes you can deal with people without necessarily having to hit them or kill them, to put it bluntly. Um, I think it's something that's been a little neglected in terms of some of the more mainstream sport martial arts. You know, we, we see these, these news reports of uh, MMA stars beating up helpless people or misbehaving and throwing things at buses, you know, that kind of nonsense. And that's, you know, I put it down to a little bit of immaturity and testosterone, and that's, it's okay. Um, but it does, it does a disservice to people who look at taking up a combative sport or a combative, uh, you know, reality-based program, and they go, well, I don't want to be like that. If we look at the historic ideal of what it means to be a warrior, um, you know, and especially if you look at the martial arts as they pertain to, to, to Asia, the Japanese and Chinese martial arts and, and others. There's always been a strong requirement for strength of character, for humility and for respect. And I believe that's been built into those things for a reason. Uh, you don't, you know, if somebody is not of sound mind, you, you don't want to put a gun in their hand. Um, if they are hot headed and they're just going to shoot somebody over, over a road rage incident, that's not someone you necessarily want as a responsible gun owner, right? For the same reason, you don't want someone who can inflict, you know, crippling or even lethal injury on someone or who's going to, you know, bring what you're doing to disrepute. And the reason I'm saying that is that is primarily how the martial arts and the study of combatives uh, can change people's lives. There's a saying, it's a bit of a cliche as well, you know, that money doesn't change who you are. It reveals who you are. And I think by the same token, uh, study in a combative discipline also reveals to an extent who you are, but it offers you the opportunity to embark on a journey that changes who you are and become a better, stronger person. Um, one of the tenets of the martial arts is that what we do is not for ourselves, it's for other people. It's to protect your loved ones. It's to aim for a peaceful society. You know, Emi Lichtenfeld said the same thing about Krav Maga, so that we may walk in peace. And if we emphasize that, if we teach that as the backbone of combatives, of shooting, of sport martial arts, of everything related to that, uh, then I believe it's an immensely helpful tool in the hands of human beings. It makes for, a, paradoxically, it makes for a more peaceful society. Definitely. That's, that's, that's very true, that what you're saying. Um, people who are armed with skill to harm, they are the ones who should bring peace. That's the whole point, right? Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. You touched a little bit on, um, on Japanese and, uh, and the Chinese and Korean, the, the Eastern work, the, the martial arts. And uh, <clears throat> what can we learn from the history of, of, uh, of martial arts in general to defend ourselves? Hmm. Found out a couple of key things. Um, one of the things we, we learned from history over and over again is that, um, I'm just trying to think of the old expression, um, war, war makes criminals, peace hangs them. <laughs> uh, history, history teaches us that you need to have the means to protect yourself, your family, uh, your community and your country. But at the same time, that needs to be balanced with skills that enable you to do so with peace as, as, as the primary goal, the preservation of life as the primary goal. Uh, one of the things that we have as a, we call it the prime directive. It's the thing that underlies everything we teach in our system. And that prime directive is the preservation of life. It means that we, first of all, your goal is to preserve your own life. 
your next goal is to preserve the lives, the lives of your loved ones and of those around you, should it be feasible to do so. And right down to the extent of preserving the life of your enemy, if you have the opportunity to do so and you have the choice and the luxury of doing so. Um, because that means that we stay focused on what is important and that is a process uh, of using the martial arts as a tool for engineering better human behavior. When I say martial arts, you know, and I'm talking about everything from, you know, military combatives right down to Tai Chi. Uh, so that's one thing we, we learn from history. If you don't do that, then ultimately it becomes something that is harmful to society. Uh, the other thing we learn from history is that in order for martial artists, combatants, soldiers, people who have martial skill um, to do that, they need to be well balanced. You know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the Eastern martial arts, they speak about the necessity of a warrior being someone who is taught and knows how to appreciate beauty. Uh, someone who is, you know, as adept with a brush and the pen as he is with a sword, so to speak. Nice. Um, and if we don't do that, then how do we show other people the value of what we have to offer? If we don't, it then becomes an us and them thing. Uh, and I think there's a lot of that happening in the world right now. There's a huge amount of misunderstanding. You know, you look at you look at the whole debacle around gun control. You know, call that out as one example, where people take extremely opposite ends of of, of an opinion set. You know, and automatically anybody who is for any kind of gun control is a liberal snowflake, and uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And anybody who is, you know, wants freedom of firearm uh, control is automatically a redneck, flag-waving, fascist, you know, whatever, whatever. And neither of those are necessarily true. I think it's a case of understanding what is what is meant by what each 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 you know polarization wants. Um, and that aside, you know, that's it's all debate in itself. But what I'm saying is, if we are careful and diligent to show that to people uh, in such a way that they see martial skill, combative skill, and the combative arts as being as helpful to society as learning how to dance or sing or paint a picture or do an Excel spreadsheet, in other words, a usable skill, um, it paves the way for those things to be used correctly. Um, you'd think those things are obvious, um, but they're not always, you know, history History has a habit of repeating itself. Um, so I think we're in a time right now where the world is very tense. We, we're going through some, some very interesting times. You know, it's the Chinese curse, right? May you live in interesting times. We're in interesting times, dude. Uh, and I think right now what's called for are cool heads, um, good dialogue, the willingness to listen instead of just try and shout down opposing views. And I'm talking about both, both, both ends from, from your extreme pacifists to those who believe that, you know, a stronger approach is called for in terms of controlling criminalism, combating terror, uh, you know, dealing with so many of the, of the threats and challenges that the world is seeing right now. Um, and I think that's that's something that history has taught us that if we if we polarize, things go badly wrong. Empires fall, countries fall apart, civil wars happen, families war against each other, genocides happen, um, and we need to be careful not to allow that to happen. So, so you would say that it's in an ideal world if we can get everyone to practice a martial art of some kind, they will learn those those distinct principles that we need to have everyone live in harmony. I believe so. I'll give you an example. Um, take, t take a person, man or woman, who, 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 is, who has never fired a handgun. They're anti-gun, they're scared of guns, and as far as they're concerned, it's like that's a thing, you, you know, it's used for killing people and nothing to do with it, not in my house kind of thing. And they come and they join a self-defense class, a man class. At some point, that person realizes oh, hang on a second, if I'm held up at gunpoint and I'm taught a technique that enables me to successfully disarm that gunman and take the gun away from him, what do I do then? Logically speaking, if that person is not taught how to handle a firearm, 
they're then as great a threat as the criminal was, maybe a greater threat because they could shoot somebody innocent or hurt themselves. Yes. So part of, part of your responsibility then as an instructor is to take that person and say, look, I'm going to teach you how to use this firearm safely and responsibly so that if you do wind up disarming a criminal, you're not going to hurt anyone else. You understand the legal implications. You're not going to trigger the police into doing something you know, odd if they arrive. And so that you understand the context in which you are handling this, this tool in your hands. So you toddle them off to the shooting range. They learn the basics of safety, legalities, handling, how it works, what it is, etc., etc. And sure enough, at some point, another little light bulb goes off. And there's a point of understanding. I go, you know what? This isn't the horrible thing that I thought it was. Mm. It's not the tool of genocide. It's a tool that can be used to protect me against the bad guy as well. And because it's done in a way that opens that conversation, that makes them understand why it is you want them to understand this, suddenly they're very open to the idea. And next thing you know, um, they're very pro-gun ownership, which doesn't mean that they do turn into a you know, so some kind of radical on one side or the other. It means that there's a healthy understanding that everything has its place. We live in a universe of polar opposites. There's creation, there's destruction, there's maintenance. It's a cycle. And sometimes you have to have your hand on both of those in order to be a balanced human being. Yes, absolutely. Well said. Yeah, so it teaches that, that sense of responsibility. I, I believe it does. Um, if you are aware of the fact that you carry the power in your hands, in your words, to affect or hurt other people, does it not make sense to concomitantly carry the responsibility to use those things wisely? Uh, because if you don't, you could wind up hurting a loved one or yourself as easily as you hurt someone else. And this is a lesson that I think people sometimes learn the hard way. Um, you know, I, I've... In, in, in my half a century on this earth, I've, I've, I've seen some martial arts or martial artists, should I say, um, you know, suffer some terrible tragedies, personal and public, uh, as a result of ego, as a result of not understanding the need for that balance. I think, I think it's vitally important. Um, people, you know, there's, there's, there's an old saying that hurt people hurt other people. Think about why a criminal attacks you or wants your car or wants your watch or wants to, you know, whatever. It's because of some pain that he's feeling inside. The pain may be because he perceives a historic injustice, because uh, of something he's, he's read or understood to a certain degree. It may be because he's impoverished and in his mind, he's been hard done by you, the lucky guy who has the luxury car and damn it, he wants the car because life is not fair. He has no other way of getting that thing. He doesn't have the the intellect or the capacity or possibly the opportunity to work for it, earn it, understand how to, how to do that. All he has at his disposal is a kind of a hatred and a gun in his hand, and so he'll take your car. And in the process, he may shoot you. Yes, what he does is terribly wrong, but we also need to understand why he's doing that. And I believe that comes down to every aspect of human behavior. If we understand that, I want to put this bluntly, he's doing that because he feels helpless. People lash out, people fight when they feel helpless, when they feel enraged. Anger is a symptom of fear. The guy who gets out of his car because you've cut him off on the highway, yes, he's angry, um, but he's also afraid. He's afraid of what he's feeling. It, it has an impact on his ego, on his sense of self-worth. He's just you know, been told up by his boss. He's had a fight with his wife on the phone. Uh, he's aware of the fact that his job may be you know, on the line because of the COVID crisis, whatever, whatever it is. And all of that fear wells up inside of him, all of that frustration wells up inside of him, and now he's going to get out of his car and he's going to take it out on you. When you teach people a martial art, I'm using that term very broadly, when you teach them personal power in a physical sense, it translates to personal power in a psychological sense. And when people are empowered, some of that fear starts dissipating. They feel like they have control over their lives. Psychologists tell us that, you know, that there are two, two locuses of control. There's the internal locus of control. In other words, the things inside of me that I can control, my responses to other things, the things that I can immediately affect, and things outside of my locus of control. And right now, so many things in the world are outside of our locuses of control or loci of control. We feel helpless, you know, political situations, pandemics, you, you name it. 
and people are feeling that fear and that anger and that rage. You look at the way people are lashing out at each other on Facebook and, you know, getting into these long arguments and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come to your place. Um, when you give people the understanding that there are things that they can control, their bodies and their minds, and they can do so in a way that is disciplined and beautiful and amazing and extraordinarily powerful, all of a sudden the desire to hurt other people, the desire to lash out goes away. That's why bullies pick on other kids. They're hurting. The best way to deal with a bully, put him in a martial arts class, give him power and give him responsibility to go with the power. Teach it properly and you no longer have a bully. So there's getting back to the to the combat. How 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 important is mindset in defending yourself? I think it depends. It's it's important regardless. It's important with everything we do. Um, but obviously, context plays a role here as well. If I'm a competitive sport martial artist, I want to win in the UFC or win a boxing match or win a karate tournament or you know whatever it is. Um, then my mindset needs to be one of, you know, obviously high discipline and dedication to training and focusing and winning and directing my thoughts accordingly and being, you know, positive all the time and focused on the goal. And, you know, you can get in that whole list of, of wonderful things. Those are all very healthy. Um, the mindset when I'm in my home and three guys run in waving guns, um, suddenly there's a different mindset required. It's got nothing to do with discipline and longevity and you know, what did I eat for breakfast? It's got to do with, holy cow, I need to act fast, I need to act aggressively and assertively, and I need to turn on my killer instinct. Um, and I believe in the context of combatives, because I think that's more in terms of what we're talking about tonight. Um, we're talking to men and women out there who really want to know what to do if a crisis happens and their lives are in danger, literally. Then mindset becomes the most important thing. Uh, we've seen people in our groups, um, and I can give you numerous testimonials over the years, you know, a, a woman who had three months of training and a guy came into her home armed with a knife and threatened her and her daughter. She twice disarmed him, beat him up, cut him with his own knife and sent him packing. And it had nothing to do with martial skill or Krav Maga or anything else. She was incredibly lucky that she didn't get hurt. It had to do with what went on up here. You know, in her mind, it was, oh, hell no, not today. Not today, dude. Um, There's a wonderful, am I allowed to swear? Yes. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a lovely story in the United States of a young woman, a jogger. I think it was a year or two ago. She was out jogging. She had a guy who followed her into a public bathroom in a park somewhere. Um, and he tried to rape her. He actually tried to attack her in the bathroom. And uh, she'd done a self-defense lesson. She'd done a Krav Maga lesson a week previously. And she knew one thing. I think it was like a palm strike to the face or something. And as he, as he was trying to pull her clothes off, she just lashed out and hit him in the nose with the palm of her hand. And she screamed at him, not today, motherfucker, and took off running. <laughs> and then ran in such a way that she, like, forced this guy to follow her. She tied him out, like, ran him in circles while she was calling the police. And uh, she now sells T-shirts. And on the T-shirt, she's got, you know, because she was wearing a GPS tracker. So she's got the actual route that she ran, like printed on this T-shirt with, not today, motherfucker, written above it. <laughs> and to me, that's like, there's your mindset right there. That's your mindset. You know. Yes. We need, to, we need to understand that if a predator approaches you with the intention of hurting you, um, there's only one way to deal with that. Uh, and that is to bring the predatorial instinct straight back to him. You need to do to him what he's doing to you, and you need to do it better and more intelligently. Uh, humans are apex predators with enormous intelligence. And that is the first thing people need to learn in martial arts and combatives. Des, I want to ask you one last question um, concerning combatives and, and the way crime is going at the, at the moment, obviously escalating. What is the future of combatives? Where are we going? I believe that we're at a critical crossroads um, in terms of people wanting to learn what we have to offer. And when I say combatives, I mean everything from the, you know, come and come and do two days and learn some self-defense for the, you know, for, for, for a lady who doesn't have time for anything else, right up to the guy who wants to 
you know, into, into a long-term journey of learning everything about combatives and weapon use and tactics and, you know, you, you go down that rabbit hole. Um, I think we're at a critical juncture right now where we need to be aware of the fact that in order to catch the fish, you need to bait the hook properly. You need to, you need to help people understand what it is that you're offering. Um, if you talk to someone who is not familiar with what we do and you talk to them about combatives, it scares them off, to, to put it very bluntly. I'm not talking about the, the guy who may be, you know, let's say, for example, in the farming community, it's I think it's generally well known that jeepers, you're walking around with a target painted on your forehead, you know, and, and so you, you need to be prepared. You need to get some training. You need to create layers of security and you need to be hyper vigilant. Um, that, 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 you know, that's a market where, and I'm using the word, don't get me wrong, I'm using the word market in terms of mindset. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but, you know, that's a market where you, you, you approach people in that position and they immediately understand what it is you're offering because the, their own lives could be in danger. They're keenly aware of it. But when you talk to people who are, you know, your, your ordinary man and woman who lives in a suburban situation, Yes, they're kind of aware that crime crime is a thing in South Africa and they moan about it on their WhatsApp groups and, you know, on Facebook and ask when the government is going to do something about it and why the police are so cock and, you know, they go on and on. Um, I think one of the one of the things that, that we've maybe done wrong in times gone by is we've been very confrontational. You know, it's the whole, well, you should be your first, um, your own first responder kind of thing and why don't, you know, why don't you do something about it and, you know, we... Again, it's the polarization. Um, I sometimes get the feeling that the sheepdogs uh, behave more like wolves. Um, we tend to look at at the civilian who doesn't have the inclination um, yet to learn this kind of thing, and we dismiss them as you know sheeple who are just you know blindly milling about, and you know, yeah, one day when it happens to you, you you'll see how, how important this is. Um, it creates it creates division. And I think right now, more than ever, we need to we need to be having the conversation with people. We need to be can I can I use the word marketing? We need to be marketing what we offer in every sphere in such a way that people who see it who haven't been exposed to it are attracted to it. Uh, that's a broad sweeping statement to make. And you know, if we had another two hours, I could I could expand on on why I think that's important and what our strategy is to, in terms of doing that. But I think I think the future of combatives, we're, we're at a fork in the road right now. It's, it's either going to be um, a situation where it becomes um, more isolated and more misunderstood, and it's going to be a core, core group of people who are perceived as being you know, a little bit out there. Um, or we have the option of putting this, doing this, teaching it in such a way that it becomes more socially acceptable. Um, and I think that the future of combatives, if we do it right, is collaborative more than competitive. I believe that for far too long, there's been too much sniping, too much politics, too much he said, she said, yours, yours doesn't work, mine works, you know, all of those things. Um, because, we're, hey, we're naturally competitive. We want to fight, right? It's what we enjoy. Yeah. The problem is we're fighting with each other and we actually all have the same goal. We want to ensure a safer society, teach people how to live peacefully, sort out the criminals um, and restore order to society. So I think there is going to come very soon a situation in South Africa and globally where more martial artists and combatives instructors start collaborating, sharing information. In a weird kind of way, it doesn't weaken what we offer. It makes it stronger. And if I look at the way, if I can just say that, you know, the, the way Fortis has approached this has been fantastic. It's been amazing. I think it's a brilliant initiative to create a platform where there's dialogue, where people can share knowledge and ideas. I know that my, my, my little bit of chat tonight has been largely philosophical. There's nothing practical or useful. Um, but think of it as an overview. And... It's, I think what you guys are doing is absolutely brilliant. It lays the foundation and teaches other people to do the same thing. That, what you're doing right now, is where the future lies for combatives. Excellent. Thanks so much. 
Um, Absolutely. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the, the, the mission at this point, to just get everyone, funnel everybody's information into one, into one platform, get it out there, get people to understand what, how necessary this is. Well, I have no doubt that it's going to be tremendously successful. And I know for a fact that there are a lot of, a lot of other groups and organizations looking at what you guys are doing and nodding and going, you know what, these guys are on the right track. Maybe we need to change the way we think. Yeah, be, be the change you want to see, right? I think that's what you guys are busy doing. And you're doing it in a way that is very intelligent and is working very, very well. Well, thanks very much, Des. I'm, I'm glad that it's, that it's, um, the message is getting out there. I think that's the most important thing is just, you know, just bringing information to people and whoever, you know, it might be one, one person in 150 that sees a video, gets something out of it. But that's one person whose mindset will then be changed. Yeah, and potentially one life that is, that is saved, if the seeds that are planted, mm. 10 years from now, the landscape's going to be very different. And those who think that way, those who think the way you're thinking, are going to be the leaders. Yeah, well, let's hope that we can have an impact. Let's just really hope, you know, to, to make an impact in the world, as you said. You know, because we're all martial artists at the end of the day. You know, that's, that's the core of where we started. And like you said, those fundamentals are laid within you. So I think naturally we're all just trying to make the world a better place. Yeah. Uh, if, 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 we, if we approach it the right way, if we have the right intention... That's what it comes down to. If we have the right intention, then that spills over into what we do, what other people perceive, and whether they accept what you have to offer or not. Because at the end of the day, you know, people, it's like buying a car. You buy based on purely on emotion. You go into the dealership, you look at the car, you go, yo, I'd look good in that thing. You know, you sit in, you smell the leather seats and the, you know, the, the sales lady strokes your shoulder and tells you how macho you look in the car. And you can't, you know, you, you can't do the transfer fast enough. You go home and you've got to explain to your better half why you spend so much money on the car. And so all of a sudden it's about, you know, well, it has this much torque and it's got these safety features. It's got, da, 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 da. It's got, it's got nothing to do with it. You bought it because you liked it, because it made you feel good. Yes. And if we, if we present what we have, which is enormously valuable in a way that helps people understand that it will add value to their lives and the way they feel about themselves, then that changes society. It brings people in and those barriers just disappear like mist. Absolutely. Des, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, we will definitely get you on onto the show again to to share some of your extensive knowledge of self-defense and combatives with us. But Any for time? tonight, I would love to. I'd just like to thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Hello. Only a pleasure. I see you've got your assistant there. Say hello. I should be sleeping. Hello, young. <laughs> so um, I could eat like slob. <laughs> yeah, that probably makes three of us, eh? <laughs> That's great. <laughs>